It's often asked uh, as a result of the Da Vinci Code, how did the Bible or the New Testament come compiled into a single volume? Obviously, this literature wasn't a volume, a single volume in the beginning. The Gospels were written separately. They were individual volumes, and you had the letters of Paul, the letters of Peter, the book of Acts, and etc. Et so how, who decided to put these 27 books and letters compiled into a single volume? And that would be considered uh, divinely inspired and authoritative for the life of the Christian. Why these and not others? What about the Gospel of Thomas? What about the Gospel of Mary and some of these Gnostic Gospels that have become the topic of great discussion over the last several years? Was it, as the Da Vinci Code said, that uh, Constantine at the Council of Nicaea um, decided which books to include, which to exclude, and so they banished and burned the other? Burn them all. Why is it that we have the 27 that we have today and not these others? That's going to be the topic of this short lecture. And this concerns what's called the, pro the, uh, the uh, process of canonization. Now, canonization comes from the term canon, and it's not this weapon that would fire a cannonball at a, an opposing army. The canonization means a rule or standard, a, a way of measuring. So this would be something that the measure of a person's life. What is going to be the standard, the measure of a person's life, the authoritative work um, uh, on the guide for how the Christian is to live his and her faith? Well, that's what we're going to look at in these next few moments. We start off by looking at some of the uh, t uh, different people who talked about the authority uh, of some of the New Testament literature. So, for example, the Gospel of Luke is referred to as Scripture in uh, Paul's letter of 1 Timothy. Um, and then Paul's letters are referred to as Scripture in 2 Peter. So we can see already while some of the New Testament literature, literature that made it in the New Testament was being written, um, that they were regarding Paul's letters and the Gospel of Luke as quite special, divinely inspired. Around the year 125, there was a guy named Polycarp. Now, Polycarp may and probably was a disciple of the Apostle John. Polycarp wrote one letter that has survived, and that is his letter to the church at Philippi. And in there, he quotes uh, from Ephesians, uh, also considered one of Paul's letters in the New Testament. He quotes from Ephesians twice and refers to it as part of the sacred scriptures. Now, that's pretty amazing that, uh, again, Polycarp, uh, probably a disciple of the Apostle John, is regarding Ephesians as part of the sacred scriptures. And whether he got that from the Apostle John, we, we just don't know. But that's pretty powerful that he would have thought that. A few years later, there was a guy named Justin. He ended up being martyr, so today we refer to him as Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr, on 16 or 17 occasions, quotes from what appeared the same thing we find in the Gospels. And he always refers to them as the memoirs of the apostles or just simply the memoirs. Um, what's interesting about that, a lot of times he doesn't mention the name of the author, but we can see that at least when Justin is writing this around the year 150, that the traditions that we find in the Gospels were being identified as the memoirs of the apostles. So even if we didn't know who wrote the Gospels, and there, admittedly, there is some question today who wrote them, they're still regarded as containing apostolic testimony in them. At least that's how the early church regarded them. And again, we can see that a lot of these New Testament literature were regarded as scripture, sacred scripture. A few years after that, around the year 180, there was a guy named Irenaeus. And Irenaeus spoke of the fourfold form of the Gospels, meaning there were some that were excluded, some to be included, that there were four Gospels in that day that the church was regard, recognizing as being authoritative. He doesn't list them at that point as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the four would seem to suggest that. So you start off with this, and then with a few centuries later, you have what are called lists. So by the time you get to the third century and then the fourth centuries, these lists start to be, uh, come forth of what was considered to be divinely inspired, authoritative for the life of the Christian, and could be read in Christian worship services. These 
there's no one out there that actually provides a list of criteria that the early church was using in order to identify what should be included in these lists. But it's from the letters that we have and the books that we have in the New Testament, the, the literature, as well as certain comments that are made by people like Eusebius and others that would seem to suggest that there were four, at least four important cri criteria involved in selecting the literature that would come to be included in our New Testament. The first criteria is apostolicity. Was it written by an apostle or one of his colleagues? Um, this would be probably the main criteria used. So most of the New Testament literature is attributed to an apostle. You do have a few like the Gospel of Luke, who himself admits in the first three or four verses of the Gospel he was not an eyewitness, but he got his information from the eyewitnesses. Um, then you have the Gospel of Mark. Mark was not uh, necessarily an eyewitness. Early church tradition says that he got his information from Peter. So in essence, Mark's Gospel is he's reporting the memoirs of the Apostle Peter. Um, you also have Hebrews, and we have no idea who wrote Hebrews. Um, but a lot would guess that that would be one of the colleagues of the Apostles, maybe a colleague of the Apostle Paul, since much of the thought contained in Hebrews is Pauline. Whoops, let me go back. After an Apostle, or being one of uh, the Apostles' colleagues, it was, were the teachings orthodox? This would be a reason why Hebrews was accepted in the New Testament, because the teachings were orthodox. Um, and it was a lot believed that either Paul wrote it or one of his colleagues did. If the teachings within that piece of literature was not orthodox, well, an orthodoxy was determined by, was it written, was this some of the apostolic teachings or the teachings that we would think came from Jesus? Um, well, then it wouldn't be included. You'd want it to be orthodox teaching. A third would be, was it relevant to the church um, of that day? If it was relevant to the church, then they kept it. Um, so if it was written by an apostle or one of his colleagues, if it was orthodox and it was relevant to the church, they kept it. It might be for the reason that it wasn't relevant in some cases that some of the New Testament, what was written by an apostle, was would not be included in the New Testament and it became no longer extant. And then finally, you're looking at relevance, um, uh, or I'm sorry, widespread and long-standing usage within the church. Is this something that these teachings were not only relevant to the church, but there was the churches had long-standing and widespread usage in using this literature in their worship services and regarding it as authoritative and divinely inspired. When these four criteria were met, then this would, and they debated over whether some of the literature would meet this criteria. Um, then it, it made it for interesting debates, and we're going to look at how some of the churches and the church leaders would, uh, over the years, what kind of conclusions they came to. But these were, generally speaking, these are accepted to be the criteria that they went by. We start with Eusebius, and between the years 320 and 330, uh, Eusebius wrote his ecclesiastical history. Eusebius is generally regarded as the first church historian. And in recognized, said that the church recognized 22 of the books and letters that we presently have in our New Testament. There were five uh, that are presently in our New Testament that he regarded, he said the church at that point regarded as doubtful. This would be James, Jude, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John. Again, he regarded these as doubtful because they doubted whether the authors actually wrote these. In fact, even in modern scholarship, even in some evangelical scholarship, there is still serious question over whether James, Jude, Peter, and John actually wrote these. Debates take place even today over these. Um, although it may not be debated whether they should be included in the canon or in the New Testament, they still debate over the authorship of these. But this debate goes all the way back to Eusebius. Cyril of Jerusalem in the year 350, he approved, said the church approved of 27 at that point, many did. Um, now, it wasn't the same 27 we have today. 26 of the 27 were there, but he also um, wanted to include the Gospel of Thomas. 
And as far as I know, he's the only one who ever wanted to include the Gospel of Thomas. This was the only time it was. Cyril um, excluded, <coughs> excuse me, he excluded Revelation because he didn't think John wrote it. The Laodicea Synod of 363 recognized 26 of the 27 that we have today. Thomas is out at this point. It was only in that one time. Thomas is out. You have all 26, but Cyril went ahead and he, I'm sorry, the Laodicea Synod excluded the book of Revelation. Athanasius of 367 is the first one to come along and say at this point the church recognized 27 books and letters in the New Testament, and this is the first time we have the 27 recognized that we have today in our New Testament. Then Gregory of Nazianus in 390 recognized the same 27. The African canons of 393 to 419 recognized the 27 that we have today. And then you have Jerome of 394, the 27 that we have today. Augustine in 395 to 400 recognized the 27 that we have today. The Carthage Synod of 397 recognized 26. They, they still had their serious questions about Revelation and whether John wrote it, and so they excluded it from their canon. But when the Carthage Synod met again in the year 419, they brought it back. And they said, oh, we thought about it again, and we think Revelation should be in there. And then from that point on, there still was some dispute, but the 27 continued to be accepted and accepted. The point I want to make here is that the tendency was to exclude literature from the New Testament. It wasn't a matter, hey, let's include all these, and then over time it's just let, let's throw out some of these that don't agree. They might even agree that Revelation and 2nd and 3rd John and 2nd Peter and Jude and James were, were, were um, orthodox in their teachings, um, widespread in usage, and, and, etc., but maybe they didn't think that they were accepted by or written by an apostle or their colleague, and so they debated over these things and went to exclude them from the, the, the canon. Again, over time, they started to include these in, but it was after significant debate that took place over centuries. Um, I mentioned Hebrews a little bit earlier. Was it written by Paul? Well, there was debate over this, as you can see. Eusebius said, uh, perhaps. Cyril, yes. Athanasius, yes. Gregory, yes. The African canons, no. Jerome, yes. Augustine, yes. The Laodicea Synod, yes. The Carthage Synod, both of them said no. Now what's interesting is even though they said no, they still included it in the canon because they would have thought that it was probably uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> penned by one of Paul's colleagues, an a, a, apostles, a colleague of an apostle. Um, today, we still don't know who wrote Hebrews. Uh, in fact, Origen, in the third century, one of the church fathers said, who wrote the letter of Hebrews? In truth, God knows. So again, what's interesting is even the ancients, even though they didn't know who wrote it, they were still wanting to include it within the canon. So um, uh, written by an apostle wasn't the only criteria that they used. Today, there's still debate over the authorship of a lot of these letters. Um, for example, over the 13 letters in the New Testament we have from Paul, seven of them are almost universally regarded as being written by Paul. Six of them are in question. Three of them are in serious question. And I mentioned uh, those would be 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. But still a lot of people would include these in our New Testament because if they weren't written by Paul, they may have been written by one of his colleagues or they contained Pauline thought. They were uh, widespread usage in the early church. You know, there are a lot of things that we could consider as we look at uh, these, and other questions will pop up. Why don't we have First Clement or Polycarp's letter to the church at Philippi? Because these were written by colleagues of the apostles, Peter and John, respectively. Or what if some people were digging around, archaeologists were digging around in Jerusalem, and they uncovered uh, one of Paul's lost letters? In one of his letters, Paul mentions the letter that he wrote to the church of Laodicea, and yet we don't have such a letter. Uh, what happened to it? Well, it appears that it may have been lost. Um, in that case, what if they found it? And what if in that letter Paul said, hey, I understand that um, some of you were reading my letter that had been passed on you that I wrote to the church at Rome, and you got a little bit anxious and debates arose what I meant about predestination and election. 
And uh, so I, I want to answer some of these questions for you in this letter. Well, that would certainly be uh, relevant to the church, to talk about election, given the current debates over Calvinism. Um, it would be relevant to the church, um, and it would be of interest, and if we could establish through grammatical analyses that this was written by the Apostle Paul, we would have to open up the question of whether we should include it in the canon. So this is kind of interesting to discuss these things. I don't know that such a letter like that is forthcoming, but we can see that the process of canonicity was a little bit fuzzy, um, maybe a little fuzzier than some of us may like at times. We like things very solid and, and laid out for us and very precise. But what we have today still may be regarded as authoritative for the Christian, um, and we still regard them as divinely inspired. That, in essence, is how the New Testament has come down to us today. Oh, before we go, I have one more slide to show you that I think will set some of this, uh, may make sense. I want to show you a target here and how this kind of plays out. Now, in our bullseye, we have the literature which was always undisputed in the early church. Everyone accepted this. That'd be the four Gospels, Acts, 10 of 13 of Paul's letters, 1 John and 1 Peter. The church always accepted these as being apostolic and in the canon. Outside of that, you have Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, Jude, 2 and 3 John, Revelation, and three of Paul's letters. I mentioned those earlier. That would be 1, 2 Timothy, and Titus. These were debated for a while. Eventually, they became included into the canon, but they were considered doubtful for some time. Outside of that, you have 1 Clement, the Didache, the Shepherd of Hermas, the letter of Polycarp to the church at, at Philippi, the Gospel of Thomas, Ignatius' letters, and the letter of Barnabas. The letter of Barnabas not to be confused with the spurious Gospel of uh, Barnabas, which was probably a, a 14th, 15th century Muslim forgery, uh, as most scholars would believe today, and for very good reason. So that uh, Gospel of Barnabas is entirely different from the letter of Barnabas, which was probably penned at the end of the first century, but I don't know of any scholars who would say it was actually penned by the Apostle Barnabas. Um, these that I just mentioned on that outer circle, they were, except the Gospel of Thomas, they were never um, thought to be included in the canon. Um, they were used and considered as very, very valuable and still are by, by most people, but just not part of the divinely inspired canon. And then on the outside, you got the Gospel of Mary, Gospel of the Egyptians, Gospel of Philip, the Acts of Paul, the Gospel of Peter, the, the, the Gospel according to the Hebrews, and many uh, others that we could talk about in there. And these just were never uh, even considered by anyone, not even the Gnostics or the others who um, revered them. They weren't considered as something that should be included in the canon. So this kind of gives you a snapshot of how that all kind of panned, panned out. <clears throat> 